We're going to be moving on and talking about the discrete cosine transform and the things we can do with that. In a lot of ways, it's very similar to the discrete Fourier transform, but it has its own little quirks and unique things. So before getting into how to do a discrete cosine transform, I thought it'd be a good idea to sit down and kind of compare some of the similarities and differences between these two transformations. The most important one is that the discrete Fourier transform is done with complex arithmetic, whereas the discrete cosine transform is done with real arithmetic. That means that if they were done in the same way, the discrete cosine transform would take about half as many operations as the Fourier transform does. However, that's not quite the case. Now they both express a data set as a linear combination of trig functions. That's kind of the goal of both of them, is to take a data set and find a sum of trig functions that goes through those data points. The way they go about it is slightly different, but really in the end, it's exactly the same fundamental thing other than the complex versus real arithmetic. The basic idea is that you've got an orthonormal basis, and by taking a dot product with those orthonormal basis elements, you get the coefficients. They're both built around that same basic principle. Now, the big difference here is that we know with the Fourier transform, we can optimize it for large data sets. We've got different ways of doing the fast Fourier transform which drastically cut down the number of operations. However, the discrete cosine transform typically doesn't optimize as well. So, now when I say smaller data sets, they still can be fairly large, but nothing like the thousands of entries that you get for a discrete Fourier transform. If that's the case, that Fourier transform can be made so much more efficient despite the fact that it's using complex arithmetic, why would you ever use the discrete cosine transform? And it's hidden right here. The Fourier transform is used on one-dimensional data sets, whereas the discrete cosine transform, by kind of applying it twice, it can be used on matrices as well as just vectors. It can be used on data that occupies a two-dimensional array rather than just a one-dimensional array. This is huge for the types of applications we're going to be doing with it because it allows us to do things like image compression where the data is stored not in just a single vector but in a matrix. Final thing, and this isn't, both of these have many uses but kind of the ones we focus on, with the Fourier transform, we focused on noise reduction, where we took a signal and we pulled it out, we broke it down into components parts, and noticed that there was kind of very minor little things that were added in there that weren't very periodic. And so we could kind of filter those out using the Fourier transform. On the other hand, the type of uses we tend to use the discrete cosine for, there isn't noise. The data tends to be, at the start, perfect. And what we end up doing is, instead of trying to get rid of extra junk that's not supposed to be there, we actually kind of get rid of junk that is supposed to be there. We sort of have a lossy compression. We say, maybe we don't need it to be exact. Maybe we can give an approximation and have, take far less room for what that data is. When we first implemented the discrete Fourier transform, we did it in a very inefficient way that we later modified to be the fast Fourier transform. The discrete cosine transform is closer to that original way we did the discrete Fourier transform. That is, we set it up as a matrix multiplication. Again, this is all going to be real numbers rather than the complex numbers we had in the Fourier transform matrix. But here's the way it's set up. 
the formulas are there other than the fact that here we notice that our indices are going to range from 0 to n minus 1. Again, we had a little bit of that with the Fourier transform where we had to go back and forth between the formulas made more sense in a 0 to n minus 1, whereas MATLAB preferred it to be 1 to n. It's the same kind of thing here. And so for setting up this formula, it's just a lot cleaner to take that 0 to n minus 1 range of indices. Now, it's worth noting here, we've got this overall coefficient to the thing, and then there's a secondary constant a sub i, and that's entirely based on what i is. If i is 0, I get 1 over the square root of 2. If it's anything else, I get it to be 1. Let's go ahead and try and put these pieces together. So let's just do this for a 4 by 4. It is worth noting that, unlike the Fourier transform stuff that we studied, the size doesn't have to be a power of 2. It often is pulled in that way, but it doesn't have to be. So just knowing how big these entries are, I'm going to make a giant 4x4 four four matrix. And the idea is we've got here i is 0, i is 1, i is 2, and i is 3. Whereas across the top, I've got j is 0, j is 1, j is 2, and j is 3. Well, first thing to notice about these formulas is let's think about what happens when i equals 0. When i equals 0, it's the only time I'm using the 1 over square root of 2 multiplier for a sub i. And also in here, since I've got an i multiplier inside this cosine, all of my cosine terms are going to be the cosine of 0, which is, of course, 1. So whenever i is 0, it doesn't matter what j is, I've got square root of 2 over square root of n. In this case, since n is 4, square root of 2 over 2 times a sub i, 1 over square root of 2, times 1. Square root of 2's cancel, and so as long as i is 0, doesn't matter what j is, this value comes out to be one half. Now, what happens when i is one? Okay, when i is one, I get for the rest of the matrix, the a sub i is going to be 1, and I can pretty much ignore that. I'm always going to have a square root of 2 over 2. And then what you notice here is that my j's are giving me the odd numbers. My j's are 1, 3, 5, to 7. Okay, so when I put that all together, I have square root of 2 over 2 or 1 over the square root of 2 times the cosine of pi over 2n, so pi over 8. And then those go up by the odd multiples, so I've got 1 over square root of 2 cosine of 3 pi over 8. I've got 1 over the square root of 2 times the cosine of 5 pi over 8, and I've got 1 over the square root of 2 times the cosine of 7 pi over 8. Okay, next line is the exact same thing except for my i is 2 now, so I can cancel that 2 with the 8, so I'm going to have 1 over square root of 2 cosine of either 2 pi over 8 or pi over 4, 1 over the square root of 2 times the cosine of 3 pi over 4, 1 over square root of 2 times the cosine of 5 pi over 4, and 1 over square root of 2 times the cosine of 7 pi over 4. So 
same thing only now i is going to end up being three so the thing in my cosine is three times what was in this second line so i've got one over square root of two cosine of three pi over eight one over square root of two cosine of five pi over eight uh, sorry of nine pi over eight one over square root of two cosine of 15 pi over eight and one over square root of two cosine of 21 pi over eight okay so doing a dct is just multiplication by this matrix and again the whole idea is that these lines each row is an orthonormal vector each one of these things has a norm of one so that when I multiply by this, I'm basically getting the dot product with and getting the coefficient of that vector that corresponds to the component.